Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. There's still people coming in, but it's uh, top of the hour. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Stephanie Hagstrom, and I'm the Director of Community. Oh, let me share my screen, excuse me. I have to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Good, thanks, Rob. Okay, let me get started again. Okay, uh, I am Director of Community Development at Research Data Alliance US, and, I, and US is the host of today's webinar titled Persistent Identification of Instruments. Before we get started with the presentation, I have a bit of information about RDA and some webinar housekeeping information to share with you. The Research Data Alliance is a community of over 12,500 data experts from 147 countries who collaborate and build social and technical bridges to enable open sharing and reuse of data. Members of the RDA come together through self-formed focus working groups, exploratory interest groups, and communities of practice groups to exchange knowledge and discoveries, uh, discuss barriers and potential solutions, and define policies and to test standards. Many of the 86 active groups have produced outputs to enhance the facility and facilitate, sorry, global data sharing and reuse. The RDA has 30 national groups that support initiatives of the RDA members and those regions by providing a platform to interact on a global level. Those national groups may be individual groups or they might be groups of countries. As an example, uh, there's the region of Americas that includes all the countries within North America and Latin America. There are four contributing regions, France, Australia, and the EU and the United States who each provide the resources to support and sustain the RDA global operations. The RDA US, the host of today's webinar is one of those recognized regions with over 2,600 members who help uh, support the RDA in a variety of ways. In addition to the four contributing regions, there are also 58 organizational members who also contribute resources to the RDA global operations. And there's 12 affiliate members that support the RDA in many other ways. So I have a little bit of housekeeping uh, about today's webinar and uh, then we'll get started. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so today we're pleased to um, let you know that we'll be translating live from English into French and Spanish. If you wish to listen to either of those, you may select the globe at the bottom of the Zoom control panel and uh, you'll hear it in that language. We will also be recording these today in English, French and Spanish and I will be uploading those to the RDA website webinar page following uh, the webinar. We have a lot of time at the end of the webinar for questions and you may use the Q&A section of your um, Zoom control panel or the chat, or you can raise your hand if you'd like to verbally ask and I can unmute uh, you. If there are more questions than we have available time, we will transfer those unanswered questions to a document and email that to each one of you. Today's webinar, as I mentioned above, was, is titled Persistent Identification of Instruments, and it is hosted by the RDA US and presented by the RDA Persistent Identification of Instruments Working Group. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the webinar moderator, Marcus Stucker. Marcus is head of the Knowledge Infrastructure Research Group at TIB Leibniz Information Center for Science and Technology and a research associate at the Leibniz University in Hanover, Germany. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing um, Marcus and let you pick up from here. Yes, thank you very much, um, Stephanie for the introduction. I will just... Um, share my own screen quickly. So I think you should see um, the slides. So what I will do first um, is uh, introduce uh, shortly the speakers today. 
And after that, I will give a short introduction to the RDA working group, persistent identification of instruments, what we did, the motivation, and um, yeah, a little bit of an outlook. So Rolf Kral joins us from the Helmholtz Centrum of Berlin for Material and Energy in Germany, where he's responsible for scientific data management. Rolf has been a long-term co-chair already in the working group and his main responsibility so far has been the management of the schema, and he will also talk about the schema in more details. Um, then we have Louis Dar Daroch, joins us from the British Oceanographic Data Center in the United Kingdom, where she is a senior data manager. And uh, Louis has been with the working group indeed since, I think, day one, basically. And I have a little bit of history so that um, you get a little bit of insight how this all started. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Tibor Kalman joins us from the Gesellschaft für Wissenschaftliche Datenverarbeitung in Göttingen, Germany, where he's chair of the technical board of the Persistent Identifier Consortium for e-research EPIC, and is thus uh, a representative for the PIDINST EPIC approach. Um, and we will also talk about this in a minute uh, in more details. So let me get started with the uh, introduction to PIDINST. Um, and I like to start with a bit of history, uh, since always is, it's always interesting to hear where a group comes from. So um, at least from my perspective on the topic, um, all this started in, at Pidapalooza, which is a conference series. Um, and the first one is, was in Reykjavik in, in Iceland in November 2016. And I had a first presentation on persistent identification of instruments. It's still available online. The spirit was a little bit there. Yay, yet another PID. Um, so I had no sort of plans, long-term plans back there. It was just to set an idea into the room and hear a little bit what uh, people think about this. Um, there was a good feedback there in the community, so uh, I was motivated to pick on this topic again um, in a boot camp uh, in early March, um, in early 17. Um, and this was a boot camp organized by two uh, back then EU projects, TOR and Envry Plus. Um, the topic there was ORCID integration in environmental research infrastructure, so the focus was on PIDs also. Um, but for people, but there I met Luis, um, and uh, I would say that this was where the idea of the working group um, was born. So indeed to, to ground the work and the development here for a persistent identifier for instruments um, as a working group within the RDA that was, I think, formulated um, the first time in Helsinki in March 2017. Then it all went pretty fast. Um, so in September 2017, we had the first birds of a feather in Montreal at uh, Plenary 10. We had then the case statement submission at the end of the year. In March 2018, things uh, started to kick off in Berlin at uh, P11. Then we had the 18 months of uh, period of development of the work and um, development of the deliverables. Um, so wrap up in Helsinki at P14, and after that we started publishing um, our deliverables, in particular in May 2020, we have published the PIDINST article in July, then also the, uh, the, the PIDINST article was endorsed as a supporting outputs by the RDA, and then um, we had the PIDINST white paper published in August the same year, and uh, Lou will talk about this um, in a minute. And finally, and also interestingly, I think is the latest development since in March 2022, we then um, had the recommendation, RDA recommendation endorsement for the PIDINS schema. And Rolf will talk more about the schema in a minute. So why does all this matter? So why does it matter to have a persistent identification mechanism for uh, instruments used in research? Um, it's clear that instruments, meanwhile, play an essential role in creating research data. They are really responsible in many domains. Earth science is a good example, but life science is another excellent example where 
machinery instruments uh, generate a lot of the research data, the primary level zero research data that subs subsequently um, the research communities are analyzing in order to create scientific uh, knowledge. And it's natural to think that the instrument metadata um, uh, is, is really valuable information and needed to assess, for instance, the quality and whether I can reuse uh, data generated in one context in another context. And I like always to quote Christine Borgman here. Um, she wrote in a book uh, titled Big Data, Little Data, No Data, 2015, that to interpret a digital data set, much must be known about the hardware that was used to generate the data, whether these are sensor networks or laboratory machines. And the possible usage um, that we can think of um, for persistent identification of instruments um, is, of course, the linking of research data with instruments. So ultimately, it's the research data that is used for research purposes. But of course, having that persistent linking between the data as a product and the instrument is something of uh, great value. Um, we could imagine citing instruments in the literature instead of just the models but also for inventory, for funding. These are all possible usage uh, cases for uh, uh, persistent identification of instruments. So what do we do? Collect use cases. So we collected a number of use cases from the community to understand what is the metadata that um, people would like to see about instrument instances. And the instances is important. We are looking at instances and, not, and models uh, in this working group primarily. And then we collected this metadata, we looked, we analyzed it, we looked at what is common uh, in order to guide the development uh, of the schema, which we then published. We uh, got feedback from the community um, and we released a few revisions of the scheme over time. And meanwhile, we also catalyzed the schema implementation in existing PID infrastructures. And I will have more to say in a minute about that and also um, parallelly prototype the adoption of the approaches that we developed in institutional instrument providers. And of course, we engage with the wider community at RDA plenaries. So we have essentially um, developed two schema implementations since this group did not have as a goal to set up a known uh, dedicated PD infrastructure for instruments, but to leverage the existing infrastructures. Um, that makes a lot of sense for a working group because, of course, um, to set up and to in particular run sustainably such an infrastructure is, um, yeah, not an easy thing and bound to a lot of costs and resources also, which the group doesn't really have. So what we taught back um, from the beginning is let's leverage existing um, PID infrastructures. And we looked here in particular at the data site implementation and an EPIC implementation, and um, Tibor will talk a little bit more also about the EPIC implementation. Um, so, the, and we basically looked at these two approaches and they have pros and cons. So data site, um, we had to develop a mapping of the PIDIN schema to the data site schema, because of course you can't just change the data site schema arbitrarily. So that's, um, something that we did and the, the downside of this, this is only a partial um, implementation therefore of the PDN schema because uh, for instance, there is no measured variable in the data site schema. So we could not um, fit this uh, metadata that is really important for instruments into the metadata schema. Also model name is not included and some things have to be bended a little bit the terminology here. So creator, which is a, metadata field for the data in the data size schema doesn't really fit for um, PIDIN schema so well. So we use that for manufacturer, publisher, publication year, all these things are a little bit not so uh, meaningful uh, for uh, instruments. The advantage is that data site is of course a globally known PIDIN infrastructure and that um, is, a, is a plus on, on, on data site side. EPIC, on the contrary, is perhaps more a European-centric PID infrastructure provider, so more known maybe in Europe, but has the great advantage um, of uh, being able to support a full PID schema implementation uh, in contrast to data side. 
So here, very quickly, I think this is quite known how this works, right? So we have the data side approach here, prototyped by Helmholtz Centrum Berlin. Um, so we have a, a search interface in the data side. You can search these DOIs for instruments, which um, unfortunately we cannot filter yet at the instrument level. So this is something that we're working on with data side so that we can um, specify we are specifically interested in instruments. But this is what you get as a result on the data side site search and then you can of course uh, uh, resolve these DOIs and you get a landing page in this case uh, from uh, Helmholtz Center Berlin with additional information about the instrument. Um, similarly the EPIC approach as I said before here um, we have a full implementation of the PDIN schema so you can see in the center it's small here you can also accommodate for measured variables is more um, instrument specific metadata also manufacturer is visible here this is not possible um, in the data side schema as easily as with uh, the um, epic approach this is also handle based um, epic and um, here we have an example for BODC prototyped by uh, Louis a while ago you can see here the metadata at the handle the net system, but of course these um, IDs, these DOIs also resolve to a landing page, which in this case is indeed a machine readable description of the sensor in sensor ML. So we had a number of deliverables, um, as I already mentioned, this is the data science journal uh, article that we published um, a while ago in 2020. Um, the recommendation endorsed now by RDA, this is uh, certainly the most interesting and recent output from the group, um, is now endorsed, has a DOI, can be looked uh, into. And then uh, Louise will also talk a little bit about the white paper. This is an additional resource, um, an evolving resource. We will accommodate for new uh, best practices, new uh, examples of implementations. Um, we will be able to uh, change and adapt these uh, pages. But Lou will uh, introduce this resource a bit more. Adoption, we had, of course, the early adopters, uh, Helmut Center Berlin, BODC, but increasingly there are uh, a number of additional adopters. Sensor Community is an example. EUDAT has an interesting um, registry system, catalog system, B2INST, and uh, Tibor will talk about this. A bit more, we have some adopters in the data repository with Pangea um, and also research infrastructures um, with Envry community and the AVI, ICOS, but also another community of practice of interest that we have been talking and working together um, over the last six to 12 months already is uh, the effort in Australia that identifies for instruments in Australia. So the next steps, um, we, try, we plan now to submit the white paper as a RDA supporting outputs. We, of course, continue maintaining the schema and implement the required changes. Um, we like to support adoption and implementation of the PDIN schema with interested parties and also look into developing best practices, how to implement the schema um, with additional metadata, perhaps uh, in data repositories, for instance, using technologies like DCAT, schema.org. Um, we are also thinking, also aligned a little bit with the recent developments in IGSN and ROAR, um, how a sustainability model could look like uh, for PDINST. And of course, uh, we continue engaging with the broader community that's in particular um, I4IOS in Australia, RRID community, but also iAdopt uh, in RDA has uh, interesting proposals, uh, in particular to describe the measured variables, and we could link to this. So that's uh, from my side. So I like to pass uh, over now to Rolf. Thank you very much. Yeah, hope you see my slides okay. Um, yeah, as Marcus uh, int introduced me, uh, so I will talk about the Pittens metadata schema. And these metadata are the metadata that uh, are supposed to be registered in the PID infrastructure. 
that means uh, it's, it's not uh, the metadata that you might put on the instrument landing page. Yeah, there you could put more information and even community specific information. But here we concentrate on the data that we put in the uh, PID record. And uh, we concentrate in this bit in schema on the information that is needed to identify the instrument instance. Obviously, uh, so since this is a global schema that needs to be applicable to all sorts of instruments used in all scientific domains, the schema needs to be generic. And that means it is difficult to put, say, to go too much into technical description because that is forcibly uh, community specific. So that is very much on the surface on all what is say goes into technical details. But uh, I would say one of the most important points in the schema is to allow to add links to other sources of information and there you could then uh, have all the, say, community-specific information. And as uh, Marcus already explained, when you are using data site DOIs, then you need to map the pit in schema onto the data site metadata. I would like to go through the properties in the uh, pit in schema, but uh, I won't go into the, the details of all the sub properties, I just want to give an idea of what sort of ins information we, we record in the schema. And so for, for the properties, we have, have, of course, the identifier that is uh, the, the, the PIT instance itself. We have a property for the schema version because obviously that schema might evolve in the future and then we want to make clear which version has been used to record this PID record. So at the moment you would just put 1.0 into that. Of course you have the landing page that is a URL that the PID inst resolves to and you have a name of the instrument so this should be preferably meaningful for, for the users of the instrument and uh, hopefully unique within the organization that manages. As further properties, uh, Marcus already mentioned, we have the owner of the instrument. So that means that is the organization that manages the instruments that may or may not be the legal owner could also be an organization that hosts or operates the instruments or that provides, provides access to the instrument. And that is a multi-valued uh, property. You can have more than one owner registered in the metadata. Then you have the manufacturer. That is an organization that builds the instrument maybe a commercial company if that is a off the shelf instrument that would be the company that puts the instrument on the market uh, but we also have say uh, custom built instruments and then it is very likely that the owner is also the manufacturer and then you would put the same organization in both uh, properties and again, you can have more than one manufacturer if in one pittance record. Then for what we cover into, in terms of technical details, we, we have the model name of the instrument. So that might be a brand name if for an off the shelf product. Uh, that, that property is optional because uh, for a custom built instrument, you might not have a model name. Uh, we have a textual description and that is mostly uh, so any potential user of an instrument should uh, be able to read that description and make sense of what is that instrument doing and what it is capable of. We have the instrument type. Um, so you could uh, put some sort of uh, classification of, of what kind of instrument it is. 
But at the moment, there is no global classification scheme that would apply to all instruments in all scientific domains. And therefore, for the moment, instrument type is free text. And similarly, it goes for the measured variables. These are the variables or properties that this instrument observes or records. And again, there is at the moment no global classification scheme or, or, or naming scheme for, for, for variables. And therefore, again, this is uh, free text. But of course, in, so uh, also for instrument type and measured variable, if you are in a specific community that uses some kind of classification scheme, then of course you are, uh, it is recommended to, to use that terms from that classification scheme in your co community. <clears throat> then we have a date property. That means all the relevant dates pertaining to, to the history of the instrument. Most prominently is then the date that this instrument has been commissioned. And if it does not exist anymore, the date that it has been decommissioned. Uh, the next property is a related identifier. That is exactly that mechanism to link external sources of information. I come to that in the next slide. And finally, we have alternate identifier. That is to be used if the, the, that instrument is also registered somewhere else, not only in, in, as a, with, with that persistent identifier. Then you could put the, the references to that other registrations of that instrument that could be, say, uh, the serial number from the manufacturer, or that could be the inventory number used by the owner. Uh, so these are probably the most common cases for alternate identifier. And in order to say, explain what you could put potentially into related identifier, I just uh, list all the uh, relation types that we consider. Um, we have is described by, and that means uh, that would link to a document describing the instrument. You might have a scientific paper describing the instrument. We have is new version of and is previous version of. That is for version manu management. So if that if an uh, instrument is substantially be modified, you might attribute a new PID to, to the new version, and then you could link uh, the, the two version versions with uh, is new version of and is pre version of. Similarly, as for has component and is component of, you, you might have the case of a, say, complex instrument that is composed of multiple sensors, then you might want to attribute PIDs also to the individual components. And then you can say, okay, that sensor is a component of that larger complex instrument. We have uh, references so that is more or less a generic catch all case if nothing else applies. We have what is maybe important has metadata. So if you have other metadata describing that instrument, maybe in some community specific uh, standard, then you can link that. And that way you would have an, then a machine readable description, including that all the technical information. And finally, we have uh, was, was used in, that is uh, for uh, linking deployment or research activities uh, of that instrument is identical to is for the application of PIDs. Normally, you should only have one PID for that instrument. But uh, if it happens that you cannot avoid that, then you can, can at least say mark these, these duplicates with is identical to. And finally, we have, have is attached to. 
that is some sometimes you have one instrument that is permanently attached to another instrument and then you can link uh, these and that was already what i wanted to report i put the reference to the uh, rda recommendation the, the, the schema also on the slide so you can look them up Great, thank you very much, Rolf. The next speaker um, is uh, Luis. Okay. Right, can you see my screen? All good. Sorry, yes, we can. I was double muted. <laughs> All clear. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so the white paper. Let's move on our screen. What's the white paper about? Um, well, we've got our two schemas. Um, it, it could be quite intimidating to try and um, implement uh, instrument PIDs, uh, particularly if you're custodians of instruments or you're curating metadata about instruments or you're adding instruments into your data files <clears throat> so the white paper really is about just giving practical examples and tips for people just to make that process easy uh, for them and this is uh, being published on read the docs um, so here's the link and please go and have a look it's um, currently in draft form, but um, we are hoping to actually submit this uh, static form of this paper in, um, in 2022 as an RDA supporting output. So we've got two PID providers that are able to work with the um, instrument metadata schema. Um, and it could be quite difficult to actually publish, know how to publish your PIDs at these um, PID providers. So one of the first things we've done is we've um, compiled cookbooks that gives you information on how to interact uh, with the software uh, and to manage your PIDs um, at EPIC and data sites. Also, um, our metadata schema, it's, um, it's been designed to, to have a lot of properties which are soft typed. Um, so for example, you have owner, uh, manufacturer, owner name and manufacturer name, they can be free text. Um, this has actually been done on purpose. Um, part of the reason for this is that we want our metadata schema, instrument PIDs to be used by lots of different communities and lots of different disciplines. Um, but of course, lots of communities and dif uh, disciplines have their favorite best practices uh, for describing particular properties. Uh, so to help with that, we've actually added uh, properties that help clarify the actual um, uh, metadata that we're trying to describe so for example with owner name um, we can actually uh, add um, identifiers for um, or, uh, sort of a controlled vocabulary to actually describe um, the the owner um, and in this way um, if we use control terminology, we can actually help communities um, clarify the information that they're putting in there. But in addition to that, it also helps uh, machines communicate with each other. Um, so the example I've got down here is actually a control vocabulary from the NERC vocabulary server, which actually describes the National Oceanography Center as the owner. And what's great 
is if we use controlled vocabularies like this, they actually resolve to um, landing pages with structured information in them. So machine readable and machine actionable information. And in doing that, we can actually add some, some meaning to the um, terminology that we're actually using in our metadata schema. This is actually um, control vocabularies that are implemented in um, the SCOS ontology. This is using RDF and XML. You don't have to just use controlled vocabularies or, or, or controlled terminologies. You could um, use other PIDs as well. I think we had a question about the raw PID. Um, in this particular example, I've got the ORCID ID um, for um, identifiers for uh, researchers. Um, and so identifiers like this can also be used to describe um, an owner of an instrument. And again, what's nice is that with the ORCID ID, um, it, the identifier actually resolves to structured um, data pages. So in this particular instance, um, the ORCID ID actually resolves to JSON LD and uh, the schema.org uh, vocabulary. And in this way, if we start introducing a bit of semantic richness, uh, we can help improve not only for machines to communicate, but also for machines to understand. So the landing page, um, I think it's it's quite uh, well known that so we're quite accepted that PIDs should resolve to a digital resource such as a, a landing page. And I think that, that goes without saying for instrument PIDs. But one of our recommendations is to make sure that we have enough metadata to identify um, the instrument. And what do we mean by that? We mean that it becomes a, a digital representation of that instrument in the same way that uh, Sensor ML does this. What can we do? Um, so the metadata schema hasn't got, is very metadata light. So we could add more dynamic metadata about the instruments. So for example, what's its current calibration? What's its current deployment? What's its current location? Um, these kind of things may be difficult to actually update in the PID record, which is one of the reasons why we decided to leave off some of this more dynamic information. Um, a couple of examples why. Um, I was just thinking about my robot vacuum. Um, this is actually a platform and it's got lots of sensors on it, including sensors which measure the concentration of dirt on the floor. This platform gets deployed every day. It vacuums my house every day. Um, you can even uh, find uh, some of these robot vacuums will have apps and you can see exactly where they've been in your house. This kind of information would be difficult to update regularly actually in a PID metadata record. So it might be more appropriate for the landing page. Uh, another good example, because I'm, I'm from a marine data center is uh, one of these gliders, these, these underwater aeroplanes, these autonomous platforms that you just release out into the ocean and they, they measure um, autonomously. Uh, in this particular example, the glider was deployed from North America and recovered in Barcelona, but it was at, out at sea for 221 days and it was constantly moving. And again, this kind of inf information may be more appropriate for a landing page. Landing pages, uh, we've got information about what kind of content you can use for your landing page. They could be human orientated, or you could again use the structured data to help with that machine understanding. So here we've got an example of um, an, in an instrument PID landing page, um, and this is actually in sensor ML. Linking to physical instruments. We've got our landing page and we've got our PID, but how can we make sure that we don't uh, uncouple the instrument from the actual PID? Quite often now, I, when it, every time I buy 
um, a digital package like a Wi-Fi router or my robot vacuum, for example, quite often they have a QR code on the bottom and that will actually resolve um, to things like an app that helps me control um, the instrument and also um, to a manual about the instrument. So we could actually use QR codes which we could stick to the instrument that resolve to the PID landing page. Linking to data sets, I think Marcus showed this um, example before. So um, this is actually a data site uh, uh, DOI, but here within the data site XML record, we've actually been able to link directly to the instrument that's been uh, uh, produced that produced that data set. So uh, we've done this through the related identifier property with a relation type of is compiled by. And then finally, um, some people have also been looking at uh, putting PIDs actually in the data files that holds the instrument's uh, data. So the iOcean project in, um, in the UK has been looking to do this within NetCDF. So they've been using HTML5 groups for, actual, for actually describing the instruments of variables within the file. So for example, here we've got a variable that is um, uh, sea surface temperature, but one of the attributes of this variable is actually the instrument group within the NetCDF file. And then within the instrument group, uh, we have variables that actually describe metadata about that instrument. And one of the, one of the variables is actually the instrument PID. So in summary, um, the white paper is there um, to help get over publishing using instrument PIDs, which might be a bit daunting. There's lots of practical examples and tips to help with this process. The paper's actually on read the docs, and uh, the reason it's there is that we hope that paper will evolve with more examples as more and more instrument PIDs get uh, used. And we're hoping to submit a static version of the RDA output for as an RDA supporting output in 2022. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Louise, for introducing the white paper. And finally, uh, Tibor, enlighten us about uh, Betweenst. Tibor, you're still muted. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Can you confirm, please, that you see the presentation mode? All good. OK. Yeah, welcome also from my side. Um, as the last speaker, I think I have to be very careful with the time. So um, today, I will briefly introduce the B2In service, uh, which is um, a service for present identification um, of instruments. First, I will speak um, about our motivation, why we are creating uh, this service. Um, and then I briefly show the proof of concept we have at the moment. And I will also say some words about our current activities and the future developments we are working on. So let's start with the basic idea and uh, what our motivation was to start with this service. Um, we saw several developments out there and identified uh, some trends. Uh, basically, first we found that dedicated registries were created on the community level for any kind of sensors, uh, small or big uh, registries, but they usually um, used uh, heterogeneous data models. And uh, this, of course, led to the issue how to harmonize the instruments metadata across sensor networks, for example. And on the other side, uh, some registries started to assign person identifiers for their instruments. 
So we saw an emerging new kind of a PID type, uh, which has been created. Since not everybody wants to run or can run such services on their own, there was some demand for a public service to describe, register, and reference instruments. What is the advantage to register PIDs for instruments? And uh, what could be uh, possible impacts of using such uh, uh, registry service for instruments? So using PIDs means uptake for the instrument by sharing some data about the instruments and by identifying it uniquely. There is a possibility then for tracking in both directions if the PID of an instrument is added to any kind of research outputs like publications, then uh, instruments PIDs can track the instruments uh, which related to data sets. And uh, you can see what instruments was used to create the data sets. Or on the other way around, instrument PIDs can also help to track the scientific output of instruments. All this might help us to set up some value added services like generic discovery services or PID graphs. So how could such a service look like? Um, for example, this is the B2inst service and the um, landing page um, of the proof of concept for the B2inst service. Um, we used an established technology um, called B2Share and branded B2Share in EUDOT, but this technology is the um, based on Invineo, which backs Zenodo, if you are familiar with Zenodo. Important for our use case that the service architecture foresees a kind of a central, central service approach, but also smaller instances can be set up on a community basis. Um, my fellows at SURF in the Netherlands started with this technology and uh, with P2Share, we had the basic elements for a generic registry. So users can describe data sets with metadata, DOIs are generated for the landing pages, and EPIC PIDs are generated for the uploaded data objects. A registry for instruments is, however, slightly different from a data repository, because the focus is more on the metadata instead of the data and data sets. Uh, fortunately, the technology enabled us to modify um, some parts of the schema and the schema handling used by the registry, and uh, we can adapt um, the PIDINS schema. So for a proof of concept, the root schema uh, was changed and um, the PIDIN uh, schema um, was installed. I will come back to this in a minute. We also made some slight changes to the user interface to focus more on the metadata, but we kept some basic functionality, for example, to be able to upload data as, for example, pictures of the instruments or QR code of the instruments or manuals or any other kind of information. So let me show some screenshots about the user interface. This is just to show how an instrument or instrument description looks like in the B2In service at the moment. So what is on the landing page of the instrument? There are some generic stuffs like the name of the instrument, some description, text-based description of the instrument and uh, identifiers assigned to this instrument. But there are also some more uh, basic attributes. This is more important uh, for the instruments. You can see this in the middle. This is uh, particularly very similar to uh, that what Rolf was uh, showing us. And you can have some optional files if you uploaded any of them. The technology we use uh, also support communities. Um, regarding to our use cases, 
might have uh, some discussions with our communities. And it turned out that communities have very different requirements to describe their instruments. And um, therefore, the PIDIN schema provides just a minimum set of attributes we need. In B2Inst, um, we have the possibility of using community extensions and we can provide uh, a bit more flexibility. So we can define extensions to the original PIDIN schema. Yeah, um, regarding, uh, regarding the information which was registered for the instruments by default, the information, the registered information is publicly available for everyone, but creating and maintaining information of instruments requires authorization. There is a login button and uh, we support federated identity management. Um, so users can use their home accounts. They do not need to register themselves again in this service. The service itself is designed to be part of the EU portfolio, um, which means that we need to fulfill uh, several service management procedures and requirements. And the B2In service will be somewhere there where the other registries or registry like services are located in the EU service portfolio. On the next slide, I would like to show that the B2IN service is designed as a stable component, uh, which can uh, easily be added to research uh, workflows. So here I would like to show that the B2IN service, um, yeah, I won't go into details now, but somewhere there uh, where persistent identifiers are used for the digital objects. So for data sets and any kind of other uh, published uh, objects, this might be a good place to think about referencing all uh, involved instruments. Touching the current status and the future plans we have, um, the roadmap and the timeline have un unfortunately been changed multiple times. There are several reasons for that. Basically, we are now solving three major issues. And um, currently, the service, the proof of concept service, uh, which has been hosted uh, within the surf clouds in the Netherlands, um, has been moved to uh, the GWDG, to my organization. And um, GWDG is a partner in the EUDAT consortium. Uh, who is willing to run and operate the production service. We are waiting for the next version of the data site schema. So currently the version 4.4 provides some possibilities uh, to include uh, instrument metadata into the PID record itself or into the metadata of the PID record. And the next version, which is planned for this year, will include further support for instruments uh, to include um, better the relation type properties. Also, we are waiting uh, for the next version of the basic technology B2Share, uh, which would give us much more flexibility how to handle metadata extensions, which are required uh, by our community use cases. Yeah, with this, I would finish uh, my presentation and uh, I think I will give floor for questions. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Tibor, um, for the B2Inst introduction. I think uh, that's a very valuable resource. Um, so now we have um, a few minutes left, I would say about four minutes or so. Um, for questions. So I would like to invite all the speakers uh, to turn on the camera again. So we have answered uh, quite a lot already in the chat. Um, so thank you very much for everybody uh, chiming in here. Um, to be honest, I would need a little bit of uh, help here. What is left in the chat? So 
Um, I, if we didn't answer your question yet, um, please raise your hand. Um, you can ask us directly or use the Q&A functionality and just copy your question again, then I will monitor that. Uh, the chat is very lively here. That would be my suggestion. I think the faucet might just be to raise your hand. So I think uh, Jay has uh, raised his hand. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and un I'll yep. allow Jay to talk. Perfect. Okay, Jay, are you, can you, can we hear you? Yeah, you should be able to now. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Sometimes this even works, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I had a question to all of you um, with relation to the fact that with instruments, we generally have documentation of, of methods to use them, methods to calibrate them. Let's call it best practices generally. And I wasn't sure that I saw any item in there to allow linkage to the methods that were needed for a particular instrument. Well, I guess the, the, the best thing to do would be if, if these say um, best practices or these documents would have some, some PID on their own. And then of course you can link uh, the document using a related identifier with relation type is documented by. Okay, so Ralph, we have um, um, PIDs for each of the documents uh, yep. in the Ocean Best Practice Repository. They're, they're DOIs, which is fine. And we have a ways to search them and things, but we can provide a direct linkage uh, into your system if that's something that's desired. Yeah, so, so you, of course you have both directions. You have uh, from the instrument to, to, to the documentation, you can, can use in the PID record of the instrument, uh, has um, related identifier with, uh, is documented by, and, and the other way, uh, the, 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 the relation type in the other direction also exists for, for documents at least in the data side schema. I'm not so aware of the cross ref schema, I have to admit. At least in data side, uh, there is a relation type, I believe it is called documents or something like that. And then you could link that instrument PID from, from, your, from your describing document. Yeah, that would be very attractive and maybe reverse the other way so that in the descriptions that we have the metadata we would also cite the DOI from the from the method document and if there's a place for that we have to okay. great um, I need to um, stop here so there was one question still from Dennis I answered that in the chat and with that I like to hand over to Stephanie for closing remarks we will monitor the chat still for additional questions okay I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? We can. And Lindsay, I'll, um, if you put your question in the Q&A, I will make copies of the chat and the Q&A and send it to everyone so we can get some answers and make sure we covered everything. Uh, please join me in thanking Marcus, Rolf, Louise, and Tibor and the RDA Persistent Identification of Instruments Working Group for presenting today. Thank you. Thank you all. I also want to thank those behind the scenes Megan and Rebecca for providing technical support and recording our translators. I want to thank our translators and the organizations that supported them. Uh, Lena Harper from the Digital Research Alliance in Canada for arranging the French interpreter services and thanks to the French interpreter Yanitza Carnano and thank you Federico. Go Citrangelo, I hope I said that correctly, and Andrea Mora Campos of La Referencia for arranging the Spanish interpretation services. And thanks to our Spanish interpreter, uh, Roxana Guterra. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar uh, 
this webinar recordings and the slide deck will be put up on the RDA webinar webpage. A uh, few things for you to note, we do have more upcoming webinars in this series. Uh, the Professional Data Stewardship Interest Group will be presenting, Exposing Data Management Plans will be presenting, Cure Fair Working Group will be presenting, and so on. You can see that on the screen. Um, the RDA Plenary 19 will be held June 20 through the 23rd during International Data Week in Seoul, South Korea. It's currently scheduled as a hybrid event. Uh, there are limited available seats in person at, um, at, in Seoul. Uh, please go to the RDA website and you can find more information there and how to register. And we also just launched our RDA Data Streams podcast series. And our first podcast was an interview with Mark and Andres Robert discussing the longest running RDA group, the Data Citation Working Group. And our next podcast, uh, four of them, will feature newly recently endorsed groups, uh, data repository attributes, data granularity, sensitive data interest group, and national PID strategies working group, which this audience may want to go to. And I want to thank you all um, for joining us today and attending, and we hope you will join us again in the future.